Hello, and welcome to another episode of Enter the Boardroom with Neural, the business-oriented podcast that brings the boardroom to your channel of choice. I'm your host, Oliver Cummings, CEO of Neural, the board-level hiring platform that specializes in the high-value chair, independent director, advisory board member, and trustee placements that drive high-impact boards. Today, I'm honored to be speaking with Sir Donald Bryden, chair at Primary Bid, a regulated capital markets technology platform connecting public companies to their communities during fundraisings. Adaga, one of the UK's leading developers of artificial intelligence software for the defense and national security sector, and Tide Holdings, a leading provider of digital business banking services in the UK. Previously, Sir Donald was chair of Sage Group PLC, the London Stock Exchange Group PLC, Royal Mail PLC, Smith Group PLC, the London Metal Exchange, Amersham PLC, Taylor Nelson Sufras PLC, IFS School of Finance, and Every Child. Sir Donald had a 20-year career with Barclays Group, during which time he was chair and chief executive of BZW Investment Management and acting chief executive of BZW, followed by 15 years with the AXA Group, where he held the post of chair and chief executive AXA Investment Managers and Chair of AXA Framlington. He's also set, served as Senior Independent Non-Executive Director of Allied Demet PLC and Scottish Power PLC. In addition to these commercial roles, Sir Donald serves as the Chair of the Board of Trustees for the Chance to Shine charity, where he works to give children at schools across the UK a chance to play and develop through cricket. He has previously chaired the Science Museum Foundation and the Medical Research Council. Sir Donald has been recognized time and again for his outstanding business acumen and was most recently appointed a Knight Bachelor in 2019 for his contribution to British industry and charity. We couldn't be happier to have him on the show today. Sir Donald, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. What an amazing story and and list of roles, and I don't think I even covered half of them. Makes me feel very old. (laughs) I'd like to start with your journey into the boardroom, and can you talk us through what were the golden threads that have taken you on that amazing journey? I've often wondered how my life changed from an executive life to a non-executive life and then to chairing. And I think one of the most interesting things about it is that I didn't plan it. I didn't sit down and say, I'm coming to the end of my executive career. I want to now become a non-executive. I was asked, would I come and join the board first of Amersham and then of Allied Demek by the then chairman, one of whom I knew tangentially previously, one of whom I'd never met before at all. But they had both seen the evolution of my executive career. And for reasons best known to themselves, they had identified me as somebody who could uh, add value to their board. And I think there's something really positive about that, because I've seen a lot of people really over trying to become a non-exec, when in fact, actually, in a way, the boards should be picking you without you having to push yourself forward. And I think it gave me, therefore, more confidence when I joined the boards and also meant that perhaps people listened to me more quickly than they would have done if I had uh, been just a career non-executive. Got absolutely fascinating. Well, I'd love to talk more about that uh, when we talk about sort of building that careers and and the net, net career. But one of the things you have talked about is the change in the role of boards over the last few decades from being 90% help, where they've been sort of helping advisors, introducers, and maybe 10% governance, that check and policing to ensure codes and everything else is taken into account, to today where I think you've said, you know, it's more like 40% help and 60% governance, where expectations have grown significantly and often beyond what boards realistically can deliver. I'm curious to know, where, where do you think now boards add most value? I still think they add most value in the wisdom and support uh, that they give to the chief executive and the executives for all the other things that they have to do. It's those quiet moments when the board says, "Uh uh-uh, you know, we've seen that before, that won't work, or that isn't right, or maybe maybe you should think about X, Y, Z, uh, that uh, is where the real added value comes. I do think you have to distinguish between the two roles. I think one is being absolutely part of the company and invested in its success emotionally. And then the other part, which is being a check and a balance for the investors, representing all of them, not some of them, and ensuring that the business is being run to the the appropriate standards. But it's the first that really adds the most value. 
Okay, great. And if, if we take maybe as an example, I don't know if we take Sage as an example, while you were chair there, the share price more than doubled. Can you think of key moments there that you can sort of point to where you feel the board played that critical role and, and contributed to the success of that journey? I think Sage is really interesting because uh, when I joined it, they'd been through a complicated chairman succession process. They'd had a chairman for a very long time. Uh, the board had begun to say they needed a change. I think it's a good example of why the nine-year rule makes an awful lot of sense because it creates uh, natural break points and therefore the boards don't have to face up to, to chairman in the way that they used to do, perhaps. But they'd misstepped. They'd made a couple of appointments that didn't work. And so when I arrived, they were hungry to have a chairman who had some experience and who would be interested to get stuck into the question of strategy pretty early. There was, uh, at that time, a, a very small startup competitor with uh, no legacy technology that was uh, looking to me like it might start to get traction. And I was really startled to find Sage people saying to me, no, 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 it's a little startup. It'll never amount to anything. We've got this market. We know the accountants and so on. And that complacency I found quite alarming. And so as I went about reconstructing the board to create a, a board that would be questioning but supportive, I had in mind that we needed to actually to change the culture of the organization at the same time from one of we are the mighty sage and people ring us up and give us business to a sage that would have to be modern, agile, and be willing to go out and hunt for business with a completely different mindset, therefore. So that was the opening salvo, if you like, in the changes that then incur, uh, occurred. The board added value, I think, again, when we changed chief executive. We needed to move Sage from being very slow to develop new software and new products to being very fast. And we hired a, a chief executive in Stephen Kelly, who brought a wow factor to the business, spoke a different language, having been uh, working at one time in California, understood the need for a different type of technology development, and who could really enthuse and bring into the company people who would uh, understand the need for that change of pace. And then the board added value a third time, I think, particularly when it came to the conclusion that Stephen had reached the end of his ability to, to drive the company forward. He'd done what he did brilliantly, but he wasn't able to put in place the boring, sustainable processes, the grinded out day by day attention to detail that was going to be needed if all of the platform that he was uh, beginning to create was to produce real long-term value for the business. And that involved shifting from a an on-premise business to a cloud-based business. That needed a 24-7 mindset. It meant our whole concept of customer intimacy had to be different. And in making the, the choice of Steve Hare to take on the business at that point, uh, capitalizing on an acquisition that he and Steve Kelly together had made, transformed the, the business, I think, almost completely. God, what an amazing collection of examples there. When you, when you, I mean, strategy is one that always I find difficult to to sort of grasp and where the responsibility sits in different organizations. Some have it led very much by the chair, others have it coming more from the board. How, how did you go about setting that strategy? Oh, I made it very clear the strategy was the chief executive's strategy, which he would bring to the board. The board would test and endorse or reject. And indeed, in uh, Amersham at one point, I remember a, an away day when the board rejected the, the strategy that the executives uh, came with. And there was a very frenzied and tense night during which there was a rethink. It was to the huge credit of the executives of, uh, of Amersham at the time that they were flexible and could understand the reasons why we'd rejected the strategy. And that set Amersham on a totally different course. So it wasn't that the board was telling the executive what the strategy should be, but it was telling the board what were the necessary parts of a strategy, if you like, the, the linchpins of a strategy that they then had to fill in the, the, the detail and color of to, to make it executable. Got it. And as a chair, how do you go about that 
process? Are you iterating with this chief exec, informing it? Do you let them pull the first draft together? Generally, it's not a, a discrete process. So the elements that come into a strategy document, for example, will have been discussed probably two or three times by the board anyway en route, because some of it is about the living and live experience of the business. But yes, I would expect to see the, 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 the probably the, the almost last draft, but it would be on the basis of information that the board was familiar with and knew about. And if the chief executive thought there was a gigantic new idea that had just suddenly exploded uh, inside everyone's heads, then uh, I would expect he would have shared that very quickly. Got it. So how does a situation like the one you, you referenced there, where there is a complete rejection of the strategy, come about? Well, it was about the ownership of the company. So uh, the question was, could uh, Amersham invest sufficiently to succeed? Or did it need to partner with somebody else to to reach that? Perhaps slightly over us, optimistically, the executives started by thinking they could do it. But the benefit of the breadth of experience around the board, when everybody was saying the same thing, that yes, you'd get somewhere, you'd achieve quite a lot. But if you really wanted to achieve, you needed uh, more horsepower, more capital, and, and, and uh, some form of different partnership. The light bulb came on for everyone. Okay, brilliant. And, and looking at the other side of the coin, where have you seen boards get it wrong? Gosh, this sounds terrible. I don't think I have seen boards really get it wrong. I've seen them take too long to do things. So we're, we're without naming the company, we're, and it's not Sage, where a company needed to change its management, but the management was extremely personable, friendly, enjoyable company and who were very nearly perfect but the board knew in its heart of hearts that they would have to make a change falling into the trap of taking too long giving people a second third fourth chance when actually you probably know deep down they weren't going to succeed that's probably the biggest mistake uh, that i've seen boards make interesting i know some boards who do a periodic traffic light review of the chief executive where they get each of the board members to give them a red, amber, green without the chief exec present and and discuss it as a way to make sure that they continue to assess that in as objective a way as possible. What what are the ways that you go about encouraging your boards to stay on top of that question? I think red, amber, green is a bit simplistic. I expect the the non-execs to meet in executive session quite frequently, not to reproduce or to to do what boards do in the normal course of their business. It's not a sort of shadow board, but one where you can talk about precisely the the performance of the executive in an uninhibited way. But to be concrete, I've uh, worked with a psychologist who has developed tools which allow you to assess the chief executive on a whole range of issues uh, with the, the acceptance of the chief executive to tell where a personality is changing or a style is changing, because it's not generally a question of are they right or wrong or are they making good or bad decisions. It's very often a much more holistic question. There was a famous paper written by Anna Mann years ago called Taming Narcissus about how many chief executives, once they were really in power, lost touch with reality and and began to uh, behave in erratic ways and perhaps dictatorial ways. And by having a a check of that evolution of behavior legitimizes a discussion between the board and the chief executive about their behavior without it having to be a cause celebre every time it's raised. Uh, And I found that tool to be really helpful. Super interesting. If if I'm sitting here as a new chair and I ask you for your advice on how should I think about constructing my board papers, you've talked about one topic there that you create that time out to assess the executive. What are the other billing blocks that you think are critical for any board agenda as you look over a sort of 12 month cycle? Well, there's, there's bread and butter stuff. You will want a finance report on you uh, and so on. 
the agenda should make space for executives to come and present on their pieces of the business. One, because it gives you a chance to meet other executives and see how they uh, shape up. And two, because it gives you much more insight into the business. Uh, I think there needs to be space for a people stroke culture session each year. There's obviously a benefit in a strategy session, often away from the day-to-day -day of a, an ordinary board. But then I think it depends on the business. It would be very surprising not to have a deep dive on customers or a deep dive on technology at least once a year. And there are other subjects like that, which are naturals. I have insisted for the last several years that cybersecurity is the first item on the agenda because it's existential. And I wanted also very much to establish that it was the chief executive's responsibility. Whilst there may be a CISO who is the executive minute to minute, the, the problem belongs with the chief executive and isn't one that they can easily delegate. And that's caused much better discussion at boards, I think, to try and understand what the risks are in the cybersecurity world. Does that give you a flavor? That's brilliant. I'd love to hear more about that when you talk about cybersecurity. I think a lot of people feel very uncomfortable with you know getting their heads around cybersecurity. And it's interesting that you put it at the top of the agenda. I mean, I sometimes hear people say we put people or health and safety at the top of the agenda because, you know, we need to focus on that. W what is it that you discuss about cybersecurity on each agenda? And, and what is it that you think other boards need to be thinking about, other board members need to be thinking about? The cybersecurity session tends to evolve because as the non-execs ask more and more questions, so the reports get more and more detailed. And that takes you into areas that you may have thought complacently were fine until you start discovering if you really dig in, patching would be a good example of that, where patching perhaps wouldn't come up naturally in the in, a, in sort of the first iteration of the reports that a CISO might give. But by the time he's been asked a couple of questions about patching, you can bet that there's the next report, there'll be a little section on patching and so on. And so you build up a, a, as holistic a, a picture as you can I found it very helpful to have external people come as well to give you a different perspective of where the world is and make sure you've got really good sort of monitoring charts, ones which can give you a sense. I mean, none of us will be perfect. So how far away from perfect are we and what do we have to do to get there and how and are we achieving it in the time frame that we expected? And life isn't linear in these areas. So just as you think you're getting on top of it, something will happen from left field, which means that always to be recalibrated. So it becomes quite a complex process, I think, uh, to monitor. Interesting. I mean, you know, I suppose there's, there are certain sort of qualifications, what the ISO one is now, that obviously as an organization you can go through. A lot of the technical people I speak to say, look, technically, you know, unless you're defending against governments, there's a, you know, rel your biggest risk is your people, the phishing attacks that they're going to suffer. How do you sort of think about that at the board level of the sort of technical versus people risk and, and where does the mix? Yeah, I don't think it's helpful to say one is more important than the other, but they're both they're both very important. And actually, I think it's very important that cybersecurity is linked to security generally. So physical security, making sure people don't walk off with laptops they're not supposed to walk off with can be just as important as anything that's highly technical. So linking security and cybersecurity in that way, making sure that you've thought through what the consequences of people consequences of people decisions are. You know, the most at risk you are is from disaffected people. So how did they become disaffected? And did you know there were people who were disaffected? And uh, have you caused somebody to be disaffected by firing them, but leaving them in in a place where they can access systems and do damage if they're if they want to misbehave? All of that. Uh, comes into the discussion. Amazing. You've talked in the past about the need to limit the number of board seats for an effective board. And at the same time, you've also talked about the huge potential for advisory boards separate from those sort of governance responsibilities to expand what you can cover. How do you think about the optimum board size and structure? It's interesting to think that it was about 22 years ago Amersham had a scientific advisory board, and it was a terrific way to help those of us who were not life sciences specialists 
to bridge to understand uh, some of the issues that were facing the, the company at that time. And the board interacted with that advisory board two or three times a year to hear their views and think. And in fact, it led on to a way of operating for the Amersham board, which I think could be characterized as the, the sort of business guys had first voice on business issues and the scientists sort of deferred to them on business issues. And the scientists had first voice on scientific issues and the businessmen sort of deferred to them. I say sort of because actually everybody had lots of common sense and, and, and input each way. But it made for a very effective board where people were respectfully listening to others because they had a diversity of experience. So can you, do you see a world sometime in the future where boards have multiple, I mean, one of the boards we sometimes hear people talking about are horizon boards, where they're getting, you know, I suppose, a younger makeup of board member feeding in perspectives. We've seen people having international growth advisory boards where they have people from completely different industries coming in and giving them, you know, advice on on how to grow. I mean, what what do you think, where's the limit to that structure and at what point does it become overwhelming? I don't know where the limit is, but I think you would know it in each individual company because I think every case will be different. I think what is really important is that you've thought through what the relationship between the chief executive and these boards is because what you don't want to do is to be creating new layers of governance which become uh, a cost and an expense to the business and a confusion for the chief executive and the executives as to who they should listen to. So I rather favor the uh, chief executive being the person who manages the, the advisory boards and the, the main board uh, interacts with the advisory boards if and when it wants to try and avoid the, the danger of overkill. Uh, one of the questions that I, well, two things. One I like doing is to set objectives for the board. I think it's a very strange world that we have that sets objectives for the chief executive. He sets, he or she sets objectives for all the other executives. And yet, curiously and strangely, uh, the board don't have any objectives set for them. Well, there isn't a natural and easy way to get that from the shareholders or the stakeholders. So we have to do it for ourselves. But these are objectives which are not just the mirror of a job description. These are, what are we actually going to do this year that will add value to the business? Is it get to know the executives in Washington, D.C. better? Or is it resolving a dispute between margin and, and volume? Or is it understanding a particular technology? What is it? Uh, and then identify and try and distill that down to seven or eight key issues. And then measure at the end of each board meeting whether when we've had a board meeting, we've actually done something that advances our uh, attempt to meet those objectives. That's a really useful way of creating a framework. And of course, then if you've got advisory boards, you can build them into that structure so that the use of the advisory board becomes defined in your, in your set of objectives. Do you also performance manage individual board members? Well, I try to have a, an annual meeting with each board member individually. And in the board reviews we've conducted, I've always given all board members the opportunity to comment upon each other. So you've got a, quite a rich data set. I was struck recently by a statistic I came across where something like 49% of all board members think one of their other board members should be replaced, which is incredible. Why, why, why do you think that's the case? I've not seen that statistic and I'm quite surprised by it. I'd like to see what the data is before jumping to a conclusion. Okay, fair, 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 fair response. I'll uh, dig it out for you. It's from a KPMG report. It was a sort of survey of, of directors. Yeah, there are a lot of surveys which are not done on a scientific basis. Yeah, okay, fair. You've evolved from working on the boards of some of the leading publicly listed companies now to working with a number of the leading privately backed technology companies. What's your experience been of the differences between those two environments and, and what have you learned in that transition? Well, I'm in the foothills of that. So these are early conclusions. I think the role is quite different. If these are private equity or venture-backed businesses, uh, then there are all sorts of conflicts faced by directors, investor directors particularly, 
that need to be managed. And a chairman can play a really important role in helping to navigate through those conflicts when the chairman is generally pretty unconflicted in that environment. Second one is that by definition, the chief, the chief executives are less experienced than FTSE 100 chief executives. And I find it particularly satisfying when they're hungry for advice and, and help and are willing to call and say, I've got this problem, what do you think? And you definitely get more of that in that environment. Thirdly, it's fun, but it's in a way, it's slightly more demanding because the information flow is more erratic and more continuous than it might be in a FTSE 100 company where there, some of the activities are a little bit more set piece oriented. Uh, this is more informal, quicker, pace of change is, is more rapid, it's fun as a result. So that's different. But at its heart, you've still got the two key roles, really, uh, one of helping and one of managing uh, the good governance. Is, is that mix very different? I've, I've always thought about the, the mix being very different. I came from a sort of private equity background, so where it felt like it was much more, it lent much more towards the helping than it did the governance versus what I perceive to be the way a lot of listed companies are run. Yeah, I think that's fair. that's a fair comment. I agree. Okay, interesting. In December 19, you were invited by the government to lead a review on how to fix audit quality and effectiveness review. And you argued there for a new definition of the purpose of audit from sort of audit today being fundamentally restricted to assuring the material accuracy of the financial statements. And even with that restricted scope, only partially really meeting that objective to a new definition of the purpose of audit is helping to establish and maintain deserved confidence in a company and its directors and in the information for which they have responsibility to report, including the financial statements. In practical terms, how do you think about that audit committee role as a chair? And what have been your most notable experiences that you think others can learn from in that regard? I think there are two things that the stakeholders want from their audit they really want to know, is the company being properly run? And secondly, is it going to survive uh, for a, a yeah, reasonable uh, length of time? And I think if you have those two objectives in mind, then all the information that's produced in the audit ought to be trying to help you to answer one of those two uh, questions. It's quite interesting. It's taken a long time. I mean, we've had quite a lot of prime ministers and secretaries of state for business in the intervening period. But very slowly, many of the recommendations are beginning to to to, to uh, have effect. And actually, I was looking at a sort of little list of, of, of how many of them are sort of in train now. And actually, it's quite surprising how many are. I think things like a resilience statement are going to prove to be lasting and, and, and really of value. So I think it's the same for audit committees. I think audit committees have got to be asking themselves the same, basically the same two questions at heart and in their monitoring and uh, evaluation of the company, uh, they need to have those in, in, in mind, but equally in the way in which they interact with the auditor. Uh, it is the audit committee that appoints the auditor, not the chief executive. It should be the chairman of the audit committee that has uh, the principal relationship with the auditor, not the CFO. Uh, there may be a practical day-to-day -day organizational relationship for the CFO, but the the client is the audit committee and therefore the, uh, through them the board. And I think sometimes that got lost over the last uh, 20 years or so. And in the cases where there have been scandals, I think that's pretty evident uh, that uh, audit committees weren't really doing their job fully. So that was the, the, the basic background to the recommendations. And so when, if, you know, if you're sitting in front of uh, someone who's taking on their first audit chair role and they say to you, so Donald, can you give me you know, advice? Uh, how do I, what, what, what should I be you know, on the lookout for? How, what, what are the questions I should be asking? What are your tips? I think the starting place is, are you clear in your own mind that you want to inform yourself and others as a result of your work? It isn't informing yourself or others just to accept that the auditor, the external auditor, telling you that you've obeyed IFRS rules. You can obey IFRS rules and go bust. So are you asking the bigger questions? 
I remember, gosh, it's a very, very long time ago, somebody saying to me, the question the auditor or the audit committee should be asking is not how many cars do the executives have in the car park down there below the, below the uh, top of the building? Uh, why do they have so many cars? I think sometimes we, the audit committee chairs get lost on counting the cars rather than wondering about why, the, why there's a fleet at all. I love that. You you very modestly said that in the past you were not an ex- expert on audit prior to doing that report. What were the things that you, as a very seasoned chair, learned that you wish you'd known previously? I don't think. Well, first of all, I didn't know that there was a, no such thing as an audit, audit profession. I'd heard the expression audit profession a million times, but then I discovered there actually wasn't such a thing as an audit profession. There was an accountancy profession, and people did some modules about audit, but that's quite a different thing. So that was that was the very, very big lesson, number one. Two, I think I was very struck by how good so many of the auditors are, how extremely hard they work but how much time they put into proving tiny details to to satisfy themselves against rules whilst losing sight of the need to inform people. I mean, auditors get a fantastic and unique and privileged insight into how a company operates. And if an auditor is being told that this is a wonderfully collegiate company and everybody shares information, and if the reality is what they find is a completely siloed company in which people are competing to hold on to information, to my mind, they should find a mechanism to tell people that because that's that's informing them about the sort of company that they're being asked to invest in or to do business with. And I think I was quite startled by how rules-bound a lot of the audit process was. Yes, gosh, I remember actually when I did an internship a long time ago in a company which should remain nameless but big listed company and it was being audited at the time. And uh, I remember the team sort of saying to me just, you know, Let's not overcomplicate this. Otherwise, they're going to start answer, asking more questions. And it was that mindset, very sort of defensive, where they just wanted to keep everything as simple as possible, which you know, I guess is a, a warning sign of an organization that you know, isn't, isn't open and transparent. Very interesting. And I want to move on to talk a little bit about another aspect that you, you touched on in that report, which is this difference between skepticism and suspicion a suspicious mindset and and to understand more how, how do you think that relates you know both to auditors but also to sort of board members and how can you how do you behave uh, with with suspicion whilst maintaining trust and the relationship yeah it's an intelligence suspicion I and mean, the, the the point i was making about suspicion i think came particularly although i don't have all the details of it from the one mdb case where there was a huge amount of money unable to be traced, and yet three sets of auditors in succession had all been willing to do the audit and accept information that they were told. If they'd approached it with a really constructively suspicious mind, they would have asked uh, for more information to establish where that money really was or if that money really existed. So I don't want to overplay this. I don't think you go around saying, I don't believe you until you've proved that everything you say to me is true. (laughs) But if you've got any suggestion that there might be something not quite as it should be, then you really do have to be both skeptical and suspicious and get get data to prove what it is that you think or, or disprove whatever it is that you think. And I think you can do that. I remember somebody saying to me that the best non-executive directors were disagreeable in a very agreeable way. And I think you can be suspicious in a very agreeable way as well. Over time, have you picked up any sort of mental model or way of thinking about where to draw that line? Because I can think of certain organizations that have gone wrong, where as I look at it as an outsider, I think, gosh, would I have asked the questions that would have you know, uncovered that where they had been given a report that said, you know, this is fine by an independent party. And had they gone and double checked that or, you know, gone a level beyond, then maybe they would have uncovered it. But actually, you know, you have so many things to do as a board member and so many things to cover. It's, you know, it it almost feels unreasonable beyond what you can reasonably do. How do you sort of judge and think about when to dig that? I think you're putting your finger on the biggest challenge that boards have. I can think of an example in my life where 
we didn't feel quite right. The board as a whole didn't feel quite right about the information it was being given. So it sought uh, evidence from the general counsel. The general counsel reassured us, still didn't feel quite right, re-examined the chief executive on the subject, still didn't feel quite right, got an independent report, spoke to suppliers, all of whom were reassuring us and still didn't feel quite right. And it, that's a really difficult place to be and you keep on just digging and digging. Uh, it takes time. That's the other thing. And of course, if bad things are happening, they can be happening faster than you can be digging. So I think you put your finger right on the, the hardest job for boards. All you can do is to ask yourself in the morning, am I doing this honestly and to the best of my ability uh, within all the constraints that exist? Uh, and if you can say yes to that, then I think you're doing your job properly. Yeah, it's a really difficult one. I was just talking to a chair recently who who had the other side of that experience where they had a board member who kept pushing and pushing and in their view was just misjudging it. And they had the entire board, the rest of the board, all think think this was crazy. They invested huge amounts of cost and time and they had to do it because once this person, you know, had asked the question and despite getting the second and third and fourth level of reassurance, they still weren't happy. And to this chair's way of thinking, this was a sort of a little bit like a dog with a bone and they just were, were lacking maturity and judgment. But I know of an example that's exactly like that, where that one person turned out to be right. Right. But it took a long time and a change of chair before before it uh, before the uh, the matter was resolved. It wasn't one I was involved with personally, but I think you've got to be very willing to overspend in circumstances like that. Really tough, and and courageous as the individual mm-hmm. to keep pushing when everyone else who's sort of you know yep. experienced and wise is saying, "Look, you're wasting our time." It's Henry Fonda and the 12 Angry Men, isn't it? Really, really challenging. I want to move on to talk about Ned Careers, and you touched on it a little bit earlier, and you've expressed your concerns about non-execs who are sort of dependent on the the compensation and, as a result, are not able to be truly independent. At the same time, you've got others who've expressed concern about non-executive roles being under-remunerated relative to the risk they take, where the implication is that you know good people will not be proportionally attracted into the role when all other things are equal, if they have two opportunities where they have equal sort of purpose and, and it's just the remuneration that's differentiating. Not entirely unrelated, where sort of unpaid roles limit the ability to include those who might offer diverse perspectives where they can't do it without the salary. How do you think about sort of reconciling those different perspectives? I think the first point is a serious point. The uh, I've had one non-exec say to me, could she go and join another company's board as well? And I said, I didn't think so because there was a conflict. And she said, well, the net present value of my fees on the other board will be greater than the net present value of the fees on this board. So I'm going to take the other board. And she resigned. I thought that was so wrong on so many levels. But I fear that that, that a little bit of that mindset is creeping into uh, the non-executive life. I think the fact that a lot of people are stopping work earlier as executives, but still need uh, an income is also accelerating that problem. And as you say, non-executive directors have to be prepared to resign and walk away if they don't like what they see. And it's difficult to do that if you're getting paid so much that your lifestyle depends on the fees. So it's right that the fees are not uh, enormous. And getting that balance between that and and what's uh, too little is really difficult. Uh, I think the test is, can you find good, really good non-executive directors? The market will, will will sort itself out. If you can't find really good non-executives, then uh, uh, you may have to pay more, and we'll see that through time. But I think also there's there's so much expectation put on boards now to have achieved things uh, that we probably somewhere in the next decade need a, a little touch on the pause button to say, is the role of the board actually well enough defined? Are the checks and balances now that are asked best best exercised through our sort of board? I'm very satisfied that the unitary board is the right structure. I think having the executives on the board with, e- with equal liability and responsibility is a, an excellent aspect of British governance. But I'm wondering whether the board is is 
structured in the optimal way and whether you couldn't have a different construct where you've got a board which is strategically advisory, another board which is purely governance, which would meld towards a more informative audit profession. But these are really big questions and it would take, you know, it, it's a 20 year journey to, to make changes of that nature. But it'll only take three or four big scandals for, for that sort of discussion, I think, to come back on the table. What do you think holds that back? Because I mean, that resonates completely with me. And in my experience, often actually people will lean more towards one aspect or the other. They'll be stronger. You know, you get people who are naturally defensively minded and others who are naturally more aggressively minded or sort of equity versus debt in, in, in that sense. What, what do you think is stops organizations from going down that path now? Well, we've got a stack of rules which say you've got to have so many non-execs. If you, you've got to have more non-execs than execs, you've got to have committees. I think it's quite interesting to think back how the committee structure evolved and go back to Cadbury and, and Greenbury. Uh, interestingly enough, I think the genesis of that was in great big boards of the great and the good. And then all of a sudden, they were starting to have responsibilities and duties. And so they started delegating them to committees because they didn't have enough time to, to do them uh, properly. Actually, no. If you're not on the audit committee or you're not on the remuneration committee as a non-executive director, you're missing uh, large chunks of, of debate and discussion, which are really central to the operation of the company. So I prefer a smaller board where everybody is able to come to all the committees. And actually, the non-execs form a committee, but put on a different hat at different times to do different jobs. But I think the, 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 there's going to be a moment where we need to start thinking about whether this committee structure is driving an optimal board structure. Okay, very interesting. I guess there's presumably there's more room for flexibility in the private space than there is in the listed yeah. space. Absolutely. Can you are you sort of starting to experiment in your private organization roles? In a funny sort of way, they are experiments anyway, because each one of them is different and they don't follow the same precise uh, structures as FTSE 100 companies. So uh, the way in which um, many resolutions are done is, is quite different to the way in which they're done on uh, FTSE 100 boards. The use of technology helps that also. Okay. Um how how are you different now as a board member from when you first took on your first role? You've talked a lot about how the board landscape has, has evolved. How have you as a board member evolved? I can tell you that at my very, very first board meeting, I promised that I wouldn't say anything. I'd just listen and learn. And afterwards, the headhunter rang the chairman and said, well, how did so-and-so get on? How did Bryden get on? And he said, well, he promised to stay quiet, and he nearly succeeded. <laughs> and, and I guess I've learned perhaps to be a bit more uh, selective in, in my uh, interventions than I was when I was younger and more enthusiastic. But on the other hand, those early boards both asked me to end up, uh, or at least one of them asked me to end up as chairman. So uh, I couldn't have done it all wrong at that stage. But I think it's... I've also learned to let people make mistakes. It's easy to head people off and say, no, I've seen that before. Don't do that. It won't work. And you, sometimes you've just got to let me, as long as it's not fundamental and existential, you've got to let people make a mistake and, and learn from their mistakes. They'll learn much better that way than they will if you tell them not to do it in advance. And going back to that first point, that this idea of you know speaking less or I guess the... the... Uh, we have one one mouth, two ears, and you should be using them in, in that proportion. What? Why? Why is it that you've learned that that works better as a board member to speak less? I think you get people paying more attention to you. If you, it, it's interesting. Somebody once said to me, "Watch who leans in when you speak." I've seen a lot of politicians uh, come to join boards. And whilst they're fantastic while they're in uh, a dinner and uh, full of anecdotes and, and on if it's a political issue, they're terrific. But a lot of the rest of the time, I've, you notice um, non-execs and execs, especially execs, will sort of lean back when they're speaking. So if you spot that people are not leaning in when you're speaking, then you know you're probably speaking too much. 
Gosh, that resonates so much. I used to be in a board which had a politician on it, and there was always there was sort of half an hour you could just check out uh, as they went on the diatribe. <laughs> you can't generalize. There are some great politicians that I've worked with several, but and they can make the transition. But uh, I use them rather unfairly as an example. <laughs> And um, you've given in the past tips to people um, for taking on their sort of first time non-exec roles. And you've touched on that, you know, it's not a career, that it's important to be passionate and, and have fun with whatever roles that you do. But there were a couple of things that you have said, which stood out for me that I'd love to dig into more. One of which was check out the chairman. I'm curious to know how, how you would counsel people to go about checking out the chairman. Actually, just before I do that, Oliver, you've got to be jolly careful when you're asking people for tips, because there was a day when I was at uh, Wentworth Golf Club early in the morning, and Bing Crosby was sitting reading the newspaper, and the newspaper was the sporting life. So I said to him, have you got any tips? And he thought I was after cash. <laughs> it was extre extremely rude to me. <laughs> and I've now, I've now completely forgotten your question. Oh, the, check out the chairman. Yeah, I just think it's it's really important to make sure that you've got a chairman who, uh, or chairperson, who understands that this is about collective risk taking and that form and substance are two different things. So what I would strongly recommend is you check that this is not somebody who's just going through the motions and, and, and checking boxes to prove what a good chairman they are and therefore they get never get into trouble with any investor body or any proxy agency because they're always ticking the right boxes. But actually where the debate is is not one of substance, it's only one of form. If you if you can ask around and check that, I think you uh, uh, avoid going into boards where you would simply not add value and not enjoy it. Brilliant. Okay. Um, we, we have many members on New Role who've been highly successful in their executive careers and aren't sure how to make them themselves stand out for board roles when up against other equally experienced peers. I suppose there are two parts to that. First, what do you look for as a chair in a non-executive when looking at their profiles, and I guess on a sort of CV or paper or digitally, depending on what process you're using to go about it? And then secondly, what do you look for when you're meeting them in person, which I guess is a slightly different judgment? Yeah, there are two different aspects to this. If you can see evidence, for me, if you can see real evidence of curiosity being the golden thread that runs through their life, then they've they, they've got a head start. If they're just receivers of information and, and then they process it, but they don't hunt for more information and, and ask why and try to understand things, then they're probably not the right person. So there are a lot of executives who are very good at doing what they're told. But you, you want to find executives who've who've succeeded as executives because of their curiosity and their willingness to question the status quo. What would be an example of that that would jump out on a CV? How could someone demonstrate that in their CV? Well, if you've revolutionized the business I and mean, if you go back very immodestly and say, when we started index funds in the UK way back more years ago than I can care to remember, that completely revolutionized the asset management industry. And it was the curiosity of learning about the new ways of me measuring risk that would allow us to create portfolios that could do things using computers, which were new at the time, that uh, meant you could see the world in a different way from the way that everybody had seen it hitherto. Uh, that would stand out off my CV as, as, a, as a big moment. And I think people who've got moments like that in their lives uh, definitely distinguish themselves. I think... They've got to be balanced. I used to say when, when trying to hire asset managers, you could often tell the ones that were not going to be successful because if you imagine them trying to cross a river in spate um, stepping stones, they would be sort of slightly nervous and tentative as they went across and they would fall in or they, you would bet on them falling in. And others would just march straight across the stones with confidence and, and, and you knew they'd get to the other side. So it's looking for that a combination of that curiosity and then that self-assurance, not pompous and not overconfident, but just a good sense of themselves. I like to ask people in, in the, to go to the second part of your question, in interview, I like to ask them questions about sentiments and attitudes. What makes them angry? What makes them happy? What makes them laugh? 
what do you do when somebody frustrates you and so on and i think actually one of the things which needs to be taught much more in uh, business schools is how to interview so many interviews just end up being a chat but actually there should be an attempt to probe and understand and then build on that information for the next person in the interview chain so it's it's that sort of inquiry but but top of the list undoubtedly is curiosity and a really inquiring mind brilliant yeah, there's um, there's a lot of data around what makes for a good interview process, and it always shocks me how few people actually understand that data and what it means for their for their processes. Don, we're going to move on to a, a new part of this podcast so for the very first time, and you very kindly have agreed to do this. You don't know the question that's coming up, but this was a question that came from a previous guest, not knowing who the question was going to be asked for. And uh, I suppose all the, I'm, I'm going to ask you the question if, if you're ready. Go on. So... They wrote, a question I ask myself is, why should anyone be led by me? Maybe it's too much to ask someone to answer, why should anyone be led by you on a podcast? I'll leave that up to you, but it's a good question for us all to ponder. Well, I would make a very simple suggestion to you on that. You get Rob Goffey's book. Rob Goffey was a professor at uh, London Business School and wrote a fabulous book, which was called, Why Should Anyone Be Led By Me? And I would read that then you'll get your answers. Brilliant. What a great answer. Thank you. Um, and so that leads us then on to the five question quick file where I say a short statement. In fact, it's on the shelf just there. <laughs> um, amazing. So we're going to go into the five question quick file um, where I say a short statement and ask you for a quick response if you're ready. So first up, your best book that every board member should read and why? I can give you two. Strange Delusions and the Madness of Crowds which is, I think the author was James Mackay, but I might be wrong, but was written 150 years ago or more and is a history of bubbles. So that uh, when you think that you've uh, nobody's ever seen this before, it reminds you that uh, most great big bubbles burst. And the second one is The Wisdom of Crowds, which is a more recent book, which I think is, is very good for chairman because it says that the aggregate of uh, the views of the population are generally right, whilst the views of individuals may be wrong. And uh, that's, true. that's true of boards too. Absolutely. Brilliant. That uh, reminds me of super forecasting. Uh, have you come across that one? No. I'll send, send you a copy. It sort of builds on Terrific. the work of that and it shows how a group of individuals outperformed the US sort of elite defense spending on, on making predictions and basically go, it goes into how they went about that and hmm. challenges the, the wisdom of the broader crowd and says actually you can get a wisdom of a smaller crowd to be even smarter still. Even better. Okay. Um, your favorite quote and why? Oh, it's Kipling. It's if you can fill the unforgiving minute. I would hate to uh, be on my deathbed and saying, oh, if only I'd done that, or I wish I'd done this, or I wish I'd done that. So, you know, you only have so many minutes, fill them. Brilliant. Your best ever holiday and why? Oh, it's obviously got to be my honeymoon and it's pretty obvious. <laughs> Where did you go? We went to the British Virgin Islands. God, I'm magic. Um, your most significant professional insight? Golly, that's a big one. I would say first thing that came to mind was that there's no such thing as a silly question. But I think probably the biggest and prof most helpful professional insight I had was learning what was really important from what is just important. So making sure that you prioritize on the really, really important things and decide where information starts to be just noise. It's so easy to get distracted into the noise all the time. But on the no such thing as a silly question, it was only a week ago that I asked John Elliott Gardner, the great conductor, if he'd worked a lot with the Monteverdi Choir. And he responded that he'd founded it 58 years earlier. And so I said to him, well, in business, there's no such thing as a silly question. But I guess in music, <laughs> in, in music there clearly is. <laughs> I love that. Just, just touching on that, that sort of the important versus really important, how do you... What have you learned about distinguishing between those two things? I've just learned that there are, and I take role models as my example. There are people who just have the ability to see very, very clearly that there's only two or three things that really matter here. All the rest is really important and blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, when we were privatizing Royal Mail, if we didn't get the relationship with the union right, 
we couldn't have done it. You know, if we didn't get the pension fund deficit sorted, we couldn't have done it. And if we hadn't got regulation sorted, we couldn't have done it. And if you could hold those three things as absolutely necessary to move forward, then you can imagine there were a million other distractions that, that could get in the way. So trying to discipline yourself all the time to ask, all you can do is keep asking yourself, is this really, really important? Or am I allowing my emotion to get too much involved in this and therefore losing perspective on what's really important? Super interesting. Actually, that resonates a lot with a book I just read that uh, Bezos had sort of recommended, not to me personally, but, but generally around limiting factors and understanding the limiting factors, not just in a, you know, it's easy to see it in a factory production line, but actually within an organization, what are the things that are really stopping you from accelerating? And I, and I guess that's a similar. Yeah, and, and, and Jeff Bezos uses this trick of making everybody read it. Everything has to be on one page and then you all read it together. So you're all focused on, on what's really important. Brilliant. And last but not least, your favorite app. I'm not a big app person, but I tell you what, I use Dark Sky every day because it tells me what the probability of rain is. Sounds amazing. I've not come across it. I uh, need to let that one up. It's pretty good. However, being told there's a 75% chance of rain doesn't tell you whether it's going to rain or not rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I guess not, not everyone understands probabilities as well as that. So, Donald, thank you so much for this. So you have just ooze wisdom. I could keep talking I and don't. asking you questions forever. This has been such a privilege. I really appreciate you taking the time. They were great questions. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope it's helpful.